All right, what's going on, everyone? We're going to get into some Ukraine war updates today, and it's a lot to cover, so I'm glad you're here. We're going to talk about some battlefield updates between Crimea, Chernihiv, and Chasiv Yar. Look at some aspects of the drone war covered in a recent War in the Rocks podcast that I think are often overlooked, but a pretty interesting aspect. It does look like the United States is on the verge of passing the first Ukraine aid package in quite a while. But first and foremost, we've got a trailer for a new Russian video game called Hell's Best. This is propaganda. That's how this works. Whether it's Ukraine putting out their video game showing the war, Russia in this case, or the United States as well throughout multiple video games and movies. That's the nature of what this is. So know that going in. What I'm going to show is a trailer for the Hell's Best video game that was just supposedly released in Russia, showing Russian soldiers fighting through Papazna in eastern Ukraine during that battle in 2022. Мы знаем, что попадем в ад, но в аду мы будем лучшие. All right, so I'm not much of a gamer, uh, but a couple takeaways from this. First off, yes, that was uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the late Yevgeny Prigozhin at the beginning and the end of that video. Wagner played a major role in the Battle of Papazna. It's likely that their forces are kind of highlighted throughout. This was actually posted, this trailer was posted to the Wagner Telegram channel uh, saying that you could only fight as Russian forces, which isn't crazy. There's got to be some limitations in these video games. I'm not exactly sure how that's been. I know Ukraine has put out some of their own games as well. The uh, Freedom of Russia Legion and the Russian Volunteer Corps, I believe, also put out a short video game. I think you can probably only fight as the Ukrainian side in those. Either way, uh, not sure what the uh, distribution is going to be on this, if it's going to be available around the world, anything like that. One interesting, kind of gruesome note, I believe, and there's a little debate around this, that the Battle of Papazna highlighted in this game uh, is where the term, the derogatory term Russian Orc uh, originated from. So after that battle culminated, there were pictures and videos circulating across the internet showing Ukrainian POWs that had been decapitated and their hands cut off with their hands and heads placed on spikes in the city center. As those circulated, people were commenting, we're no longer fighting people, we're fighting animals, these Russians are orcs, and you see how it kind of flowed from there. I've also had people say that that was just another use of the term, that it predates that, but either way, uh, in recent times at least, the term Russian orc is often attributed to the Battle of Papazna. Then turning to operations on the ground, it looks like a couple days ago, there was a significant Ukrainian strike at the Zankoy Air Base in northern Crimea. It's Russian-occupied territory in Crimea. It sounds like this was carried out with at least a few ATACMS missiles, so the Army Tactical Missile System, which can be fired either as a U.S. weapon, fired either from the HIMARS or the MLRS platform. It sounds like, again, some mixed reports at this point, it sounds like a handful of S-300 or S-400 air defense missile launchers were destroyed along with three radar detection systems, an air defense command and control center, and then some airspace surveillance equipment. Additionally, the Crimean-based telegram channel called Crimean Wind, which is a relatively pro-Ukrainian channel, uh, published that 30 Russian soldiers were also killed along with 80 wounded in this strike. And we have some pictures from that strike if the soldiers were near that equipment at the time of the impact, it's not crazy to see a significant number could have been killed or wounded. Not a lot of information coming out of the Russian side at this point. Initially, uh, it really wasn't being mentioned at all across Russian media. 
Finally, we did get some updates from Rybar. They said, quote, the assault was executed in two phases. The initial strike involved seven missiles seemingly equipped with cluster warheads, while the second wave deployed at least five. Clear footage of the attacks is available on the internet thanks to the actions of pro-Ukrainian residents of the city, as well as some miners. These recordings provide essential insights. The question remains as to why residents of Russian Crimea are seemingly untroubled by the repercussions of such actions. The lack of concrete punitive measures hampers the apprehension and prosecution of such individuals, thereby endangering our military personnel. So a little bit of a, a challenge dealing with the local residents in Crimea that are not entirely on the Russian side. Sounds like Rybar, at least, is calling for more of a crackdown on anyone providing these pictures and essentially battle damage assessments back to Ukraine. Also on Wednesday, three Russian missiles impacted in the northern Ukrainian city of Chernihiv, killing at least 17 people, wounding more than 60, and damaging several multi-story residential buildings, a hospital, and a school. Now, in digging through some of the Ukrainian reporting of this strike, I had a hard time finding anything being called out as a specific target. City center was referenced over and again. And then, of course, the mention of the residential infrastructure, hospital, school that were damaged in this strike. The Russian reporting from this incident coming from Rybar says, despite Ukrainian attempts to portray the incident as an attack on civilian infrastructure, the facility was actually used for military purposes. This is evident from the army beds seen in the photo, as well as footage showing the evacuation of wounded individuals in uniform. Preliminary information indicates that the building was housing personnel from the 5th Separate Communications Regiment of the Armed Forces of Ukraine. Now this, anybody who's been following this war from the beginning, especially since the full-scale invasion in 2022, would recognize this discrepancy in reporting. It's pretty standard at this point. Now, Ukraine has certainly had some of their military infrastructure far behind the front lines destroyed and damaged in these Russian long-range strikes. That has happened, 100%. Continues to happen. We have also seen, since day one, strikes that look very much like they're against civilian infrastructure, be it against residential buildings, or in this case, hospitals and schools, to where Ukraine says this is entirely civilians in this area, and then the Russian reporting is actually the basement is being used for military purposes, or it's that's where foreign military trainers stay, or, or something of that sort. And that is uh, kind of in line exactly with how the reporting around the Chernihiv strike is coming out right now. Then turning to Chasiv Yar, where it looks like Russia has kicked off some sort of small-scale offensive, if you will. They're making progress, forward progress, day after day here. It looks like in one location, Russia has moved forward around three kilometers in the past couple weeks. I'll pull up a time lapse here uh, showing the changes on the map. This map is a deep state map available online. Now, it looks like the focus for Russia right now is moving south and clearing the wood line to where they then could assault north through the city without having to cross the canal that runs north-south to the east of the city uh, under fire. So due to some of the water features in this area, it looks an awful lot like Ukraine has been able to pretty substantially focus their defense and build up their defenses in some of these key crossing areas to get around this canal where some of the fighting right now is at its most intense. So there's been some rumors recently that Russia is consolidating forces in this area, that they are really pressing the offensive to try to break through the Ukrainian lines. This is kind of the sole focus right now after the Avdivka offensive culminated a couple weeks ago. We're starting to see more and more talk, more and more chatter around the Ukrainian lines coming under quite a bit of stress in the Chasiv Yar area. Now, about a week ago, there was a solid podcast on War on the Rocks. I'll link it in the description below uh, with Michael Kaufman and Rob Lee. It's worth listening to the whole thing. And it, they spent a lot of time talking about drone warfare. And there's some aspects in there that I thought were worth addressing because I think they often get overlooked. The major one there is just how drones, especially the FPV style drones, are complementary to artillery. They're not designed as a replacement. And I think sometimes we see these incredible feeds of drone operators flying these FPV drones into a dugout with Russian soldiers or vice versa. And we think, well, artillery can't do that. So this is the next iteration. This is, this is going to do away with this old, dumb artillery round that is just going to hit the top of the bunker and just maybe cause some headaches and some ringing ears, but not actually get inside and do any damage. What they hammer on in the podcast is it is a complementary asset with different strengths and weaknesses. 
I think they spent a lot of time talking about where drones were more beneficial and maybe not enough talking about, or maybe I'm just artillery biased, not enough time talking about how artillery still has a significant place on the modern battlefield. So talking about some benefits to these drones, especially tied to the FPV drones, the accuracy is hard to beat. And I don't know how many videos you've seen at this point of these drones, again, flying you know, into open turrets or into bunkers with uh, opposing forces down there. Like the, the best operators can be very, very accurate with these in a way that artillery cannot be. It's real time. The troops at the front can, can put that thing up and strike a target very quickly when compared, very quickly and very accurately compared to calling back for some type of artillery support. It's relatively easy using one of those FPV drones to strike a moving target, a lot easier than using artillery to strike a moving target. Uh, it's controlled right at the lowest level, right? You could have troops at the front line of contact controlling one of those FPVs essentially as another form of fire support. And right now, for the Ukrainian military at least, they're pretty easy to get their hands on, all things considered. Now, the other side of that, where artillery has a bit of an advantage, is there is a substantial electronic warfare jamming effort happening all across the front. It is bringing down drones left and right. We don't see that footage because it's boring footage. It's boring footage when you watch the drone feed and then it just goes out, and a lot of times that just doesn't get released. But the, the jamming efforts over the front are significant on both sides. Artillery can still operate. There's a couple ways that jamming electronic warfare can impact precision guided munitions, but for the most part, when you're firing dumb rounds, or not for the most part, when you're firing dumb rounds, electronic warfare does not have any bearing on where that round is going to impact once it leaves the tube, right? So you could use dumb artillery, mortars, rockets to target some of those electronic warfare mechanisms on the opposing side. You can see them. You can see the antenna farms, and you can target those with artillery, knock them out, and then clear the path for drones. Another one, a major aspect here is the size of the payload. So some of these drones, you're talking about 0.73, carrying an RPG-7 warhead, those are 0.73 kilograms of explosives. That's 0.73. Compare that with a 155 millimeter artillery round has 10 kilograms of explosives, more than 10x the explosive charge in one artillery round. Now, you have to balance that with the accuracy, and right now Ukraine has to balance that with the quantity on hand. Remember, there's a significant artillery shortage in Ukraine, which is arguably one of the reasons that Russia is starting to see more and more progress in and around Chasiv Yar. Either way, a couple differences there between artillery and drones. Both still very much have a place on the modern battlefield. They're complementary at best. Uh, but again, I'll link that uh, podcast in the description below. I think it's a, a great overview of some aspects of this drone war that aren't necessarily getting a lot of attention. And then last but not least, something really kind of across the news today is that the House Appropriations Committee here in the United States unveiled legislation which would provide more than $95 billion in security assistance, including nearly $61 billion for Ukraine or around the conflict in Ukraine. $23 billion of that $61 billion is set to be used to replenish U.S. weapons, stocks, and facilities. So that at least $23 billion of that is, is staying here in the United States to help replenish the arsenal of the U.S. military. Uh, I'll play a video here from Speaker Johnson talking about kind of a change of mind that he had and what led him to bringing this vote forward that most people at this point believe is going to pass. Listen, my, my philosophy is you, you do the right thing and you let the chips fall where they may. I, I don't, I, if I operated uh, out of fear over a motion to vacate, I would never be able to do my job. I, look, history judges us for what we do. This is a critical time right now, a critical time on the world stage. I, I could make a, you know, I, I could make a selfish decision and 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 do something that, um, th that that's different. But I, I'm doing here what I believe to be the right thing. Um, I think pr providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. I really do. I really do believe the intel and and the briefings that we've gotten that G, that, um, that I, I believe Xi and 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 Vladimir Putin and. And Iran really are an axis of evil. I think they're in coordination on this. I think that Vladimir Putin would continue to march through Europe if he were allowed. I think he might go to the Balkans next. I think he might have a showdown with Poland or one of our NATO allies. To put it bluntly, I would rather send bullets uh, to Ukraine than American boys. My son is going to begin in the Naval Academy this fall. This is a live fire exercise for me, as it is so many American families. This is not a game. It's not a joke. We can't play politics of this. We have to do the right thing. And I'm going to allow an opportunity for every single member of the House 
to vote their conscience and their will on this. And I think that's the way this institution is supposed to work. And I'm willing to take personal risk for that because we have to do the right thing and history will judge us. Then in a follow-up statement, Speaker Johnson said, after significant member feedback and discussion, the House Rules Committee will be posting soon today the text of three bills that will fund America's national security interests and interests in Israel, the Indo-Pacific, and Ukraine, including a loan structure for aid and enhanced strategy and accountability. Speaker Johnson said that he would give House members 72 hours until midday on Saturday, this coming Saturday, to review the bill and offer amendments before a final vote on passage. Again, it's widely believed that right now this vote is likely to pass, which would be the first significant aid package uh, for Ukraine in quite some time. But that's all I got for now. Of course, if interested in this or other national security subjects, be sure to check out our Substack, which is linked in the description below. We renamed it a few weeks ago to Between the Lines with Preston Stewart because it's not just me. It's a whole team of researchers, experts, analysts chiming in on subjects that they are very well versed in. I mean, the article earlier this week was talking all about uh, transnational crime and how that's a threat to governments all around the world. Some interesting stuff that I hadn't really thought a lot about. But all of that is, again, linked in the description below if interested. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.